In this video, we're going to talk about approximate integration. So sometimes you'll run across integrals that you will not be able to compute by hand. Um, a common example of this is the uh, e to the negative x squared function over some interval. The reason why I picked that one in particular is because that particular function has applications to the normal distribution that appears in statistics. That particular function is exceptionally important to be able to integrate, except that we can't possibly do it by hand. We can't ex compute exact values of definite integrals, even though it's important to be able to do so from a probability theory standpoint. So we need ways to get at approximating definite integrals without actually finding their exact values. Another example of when you might want to do this is that, say you're given a set of data points, maybe you're given a set of widths of some uh, area that you want to try to compute the area of, some plot of land or what have you. Well, again, you don't have a function to integrate in that case. You've just got a set of data. So again, you'll need to be able to approximate the integral to be able to get an, a, an idea of what the area might be if it's not, say, a rectangular area or some other area that you know, the, other shape that you know the area of. All right, so you've talked a little bit of it back in Calculus 1 about how to get some approximations for integrals. Maybe you use the left-hand endpoints of a set of subintervals, use those as your heights of your rectangles, and calculate the area of those rectangles by adding up uh, the sum of those each of the individual ones. Or maybe you use the right-hand endpoint of each subinterval and use those as to get, calculate the heights of your rectangles and so on. So what we're going to talk about in this particular section is three other methods where you can that you can use to approximate definite integrals. And those three methods are referred to as the midpoint rule, the trapezoidal rule, and Simpson's rule. Now the midpoint rule is something that's very, very similar to using the left-hand endpoints of each subinterval or the right-hand endpoints of each subinterval. The other two are going to be using other shapes that we know the areas of and use those areas to give us our approximation. And we'll talk about that as we go along. All right, so just like always, and this is going to be for throughout this video, we're going to, t we're going to divide our interval A to B into N subintervals, just like we have every other time we've been partitioning up an interval. So I'm just going to refer to our endpoints here as x1, or excuse me, x0 will be A, so that'll be our first one, and then x1, x2, and all the way out to xn, and the x of n will be the B. That'll be our last one. And remember, again, these are all equally spaced. So the distance from x0 to x1 is the same as the distance from x1 to x2, and so on. And we refer to the space between those as delta x, and again, how we calculate the delta x is by doing B minus A over N. All right, so let's talk about how the midpoint rule works. So here's a graphic that I lifted from, I believe it was LibreText.org, but it was, it was easier than reinventing the wheel, so I'm going to borrow their graphic. So anyway, we've got this function, f of x. We want to calculate the definite integral from a to b. So they've got the endpoints a and b here listed. In this case, they've got four subintervals. They've gone x1, x2, x3, x4. Right, we have four subintervals. But again, notice that with the midpoint rule, this is very, very similar to using a left-hand endpoint or a right-hand endpoint of each of your subintervals. Instead of using the left or the right all the way through, we're going to choose the midpoint of each subinterval. So your m1 here is halfway in between x0 and x1. Your m2 is halfway between x1 and x2, and so on up the line. And that's the x value that we're going to use to compute the height of the rectangle by plugging in the midpoint, the m1, m2, m3, m4, into the function to give it the height of our rectangle, and then use our delta x as the width of the rectangle. So in general here, m sub i will just be the average, the midpoint of the i sub interval, so the average of x sub i minus 1 and x sub i, that's how we're going to find the midpoint. We're going to use these again to calculate the height of the rectangle and then multiply by the width. Well, the height then will be the function evaluated at the midpoint, and the width will be the delta x. 
So we'll calculate each of those small sub areas and then add them all up. So our midpoint rule here says that we can approximate the definite integral over an interval by using the function values evaluated at the midpoints multiplied by delta x over how many intervals we've decided to divide the interval into. All right, so let's do a specific example. Let's say we have uh, this integral, 1 over 1 plus x to the 6th, we want to integrate that from 0 to 2. We're going to use 8 subintervals and the midpoint rule. So we, the first thing we need to do with any of these rules, the first thing we're going to need to do is calculate what the, uh, the uh, values we're going to plug into the function to get our approximations for whatever we need. To do that in this case, First thing we're going to do, calculate our delta x. Delta x, that's easy. We've done that several times. It's b minus a over n. So in this case, that's 1 fourth. We start at 0. So that's our first uh, end point. And then we just add 1 fourth each time until we get to the, uh, the b part, the 2 in this case, our last end point. So our end points of our subintervals go 0, a quarter, a half, and so on up until 2. For the midpoint rule, we want to use the midpoint of our interval. So the first subinterval goes from 0 to a quarter, the second one goes from a quarter to a half, and so on up the line. So we would need the average of each of those. Well, in this case, that's not too bad. The midpoints are going to be a half, that's, or excuse me, a, an eighth, that's halfway between 0 and a quarter. Three eighths is halfway between a quarter and a half, so on up the line. So there are our eight midpoints of the subintervals. These are the values that we're going to use to plug into the function to get the heights of our rectangle. All right, so we're going to plug 1 8, 3 8, 5 8, and so on into the function. That gives us the height of those rectangles. The 1 quarter is the width of our rectangle, so I would multiply each of those by a quarter. This gives you an approximate value for the definite integral. And if you were to type that into your calculator or computer, you'll get 1.0411 as your approximation. That's how the midpoint wor rule works. You use the midpoint of the interval at, and use that value to get the function value as the height of your rectangle. And then use the delta x as your width. So now let's consider the trapezoidal rule. A trapezoid is another shape that we know the area of. Remember, it's one-half the height times the sum of the bases. So in this picture, your height is going to be perpendicular height, which is the length of each of these subintervals. These are going to be the heights of your trapezoids. So notice that the height of each trapezoid will just be delta x, because it will be the width of each of your subintervals. Your bases for your trapezoids are the lengths of the parallel sides. So in this case, we would have these lengths here for these trapezoids that I have drawn in this picture. Notice that we can easily get the lengths of each of the bases by just taking the endpoints of your, each subinterval and plugging them into the function, right? This trapezoid has bases of length f of x0 and f of x1. This trapezoid has bases length f of x1 and f of x2, and so on down the line. Notice that we don't need to calculate any midpoints here. We can just use the endpoints of each of the subintervals. So let's see if we can come up with a general formula for the trapezoidal rule. So remember we said that the area of each trapezoid is one half the height times the sum of the bases. So for the first one you would have one half times delta x, that'd be one half the height times the sum of the bases. We just said the sum of the bases would be f of x0 and f of x1. Likewise, for the second trapezoid, you'd have 1 half times delta x times f of x1 times plus f of x2 for the sum of the bases, and so on down the line until you get to your last subinterval. Notice that each of these terms have a 1 half in them and a delta x in them, so we can factor that out. Also notice that except for the first and last trapezoid, uh, bases, we have each base is shared by two trapezoids, right? We have f of x1 twice, we would have f of x2 twice, all the way to we would have f of x sub n minus 1 twice. 
So we can factor out that delta x over 2, like we mentioned, because it's in each in every term. And when we simplify what's left, we get 2s for each of these uh, intermediate terms, if you will. So we've got a single f of x naught, we've got a single f of x n, but we've got 2 f of x 1 plus 2 f of x 2 all the way to 2 f of x sub n minus 1. So notice the pattern is 1, 2, 2, 2, and then a 1. All right, so let's go back to the previous example and do this using the trapezoidal rule. We already know what the endpoints of the intervals are. We calculated that last time. Remember the first one and the last one have a coefficient of 1 that we'll multiply by. The ones in the middle all have a coefficient of 2 that we multiply by. And then out in front we've got delta x, which was a quarter, divided by 2. Again, no midpoints to compute or anything along those lines. We just take the actual endpoints of the interval, plug them into the function, and plug it into the formula, to plug those values then into the formula that we had for the trapezoidal rule. Again, type this into a calculator, you'll get about approximately 1.0408 as your answer. All right, so finally, let's look at Simpson's rule. Simpson's rule is a little bit different. So notice that everything up until now, we've used geometric shapes that you've already known what the area formulas are. In this case, we're going to use parabolas to approximate a function. So we're going to take the function, uh, split it into pieces, and for each piece, we're going to use a parabola to approximate what the function looks like, and then calculate the area under the parabola. Okay? So that's what this mess is talking about here. Suppose we have three points, R, S, and N. I need three points, right? To be able to uh, calculate a fun uh, uh, an equation of a parabola, you need three uh, nonlinear points to be able to get an equation of a parabola. So R, S, and T here are going to be three different x values that we're going to use. Here we want them equally spaced. That's all that this difference equation is talking about here. If I go from R to S, that's the same length as going from S to T. That's just because, remember, when we're cutting up our intervals into pieces, we're dividing it up into n subintervals of equal width. So I want to make sure these are equally spaced. I'm going to use P of X to represent the parabola that passes through the three points, R, F of R, so taking R, plugging it into some function, S, plugging it into the same function, T, plugging it into the same function, these three points, so it's a parabola that goes through those three, three points for some function y equals f of x. Then if you go through and do all of the arithmetic, algebra, and calculus that you need to, if I do the integral from r to t of p of x dx, that's just the length of, uh, well, basically half the interval from r to t, but it's s minus r over 3 times the polynomial evaluated at R plus four times the polynomial evaluated at S plus the polynomial evaluated at T. And since the parabola goes through the same points the function does, the same three points the function does, I can replace the P with the F here. All right, so what this is telling us is that if we've got some function y equals F of X, in this case, they've only got two parabolas, but you can do this in general. P1 is approximating this part of the function, and then P2 is approximating this part of the function. So the R, S, and T for the first one would be your X0, your X1, your X2. Your R, S, and T for the second one would be X2, X3, X4. Those would be R, S, and T representing. So it says that to calculate the area underneath the parabola, I can just do the function evaluated at x naught plus 4 times the function evaluated at x1 plus the function evaluated at x2, and then multiply it by delta x, because that's the distance between two of these points, divided by 3. Likewise, when you do the second one, you would do the function evaluated at x2, 4 times the function evaluated at x3, plus the function evaluated at x4, and 
uh, multiply it by delta x over 3 again. Add them up and divide by, uh, multiply by delta x over 3. One thing to notice is that this one in the middle gets used twice, right? I had to use it to calculate this integral on the left-hand side, and I had to use it to calculate the integral on the right-hand side. Okay? So the one in the middle gets used twice. Now, of course, the very, very first one and the very, very last one only get used once. So in your Simpsons rule, it looks a lot like your trapezoidal rule. Instead of having all twos in the middle, though, you're going to get alternating fours and twos. So you get a coefficient of one on the first one, and then it alternates four, two, four, two, four, two, four. It always ends on a four before it goes to a one. Okay. And again, the twos are coming from the fact that you use the this point and this point and other ones in between to calculate the area involving two of the parabolas. Another thing that's very important to note on this is that you have to have an even number of subintervals to make Simpson's rule work. Notice to calculate this parabola, I need three points, right? So I have one, two, three, but this one's going to get repeated, so I need another four, five, and so on down the line. I need an odd number of endpoints for subintervals, which means I need an even number of subintervals. And we need one more point, one more endpoint to get an even number of subintervals. So your n has to be even in order to use Simpson's rule. All right, let's go back to that, that example one more time and do Simpson's rule. Again, your delta x is 1 fourth. We've calculated, again, the x values that are the endpoints of our intervals, so those get plugged into our function. And again, the pattern for the coefficient starts with a 1, ends with a 1, and in the middle it goes 4, 2, 4, 2, 4, 2, 4. This, not including the first and the last, these next ones have to be fours. You should never be quote unquote ending here in a two. It needs to be a four here. If you're ending a two here, you've done something wrong. You've missed a term somewhere. One more time, if you, you approximate that integral, you'll get about 1.4, or excuse me, approximate those, that arithmetic, you'll get about 1.4022, 1.0422, sorry. 